My social media feed used to show news about Gazans on the brink of starvation. Now it's dominated by students at America's most elite universities claiming that they're at risk of starvation in the middle of New York City. Do you want students to die of dehydration and starvation? It's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid we're asking for. So what's going on here? Why have Ivy League students replaced Gazans as the primary story in the news? College students have always been the site of social protest. There's no better place for young, idealistic people to find their voices and exercise their First Amendment rights to peacefully assemble and protest. But lately, even the most upper-crust schools are looking anything but peaceful. Protesters have taunted one another, sometimes with astonishing cruelty. <laughs> Some have prevented their fellow students from entering the solidarity encampments. We have Zionists. We have Zionists who have entered the camp. Who have entered the camp. Start to push them. Start to push them out of the camp. Out of the camp. Or even entering campus itself. I'm a UCLA student. My class is over there, and they're not letting me walk in. Jewish students report feeling deeply unwelcome, to the extent that a rabbi at Columbia advised all Jewish students on campus to leave for their own safety. Some protesters have been spotted in Hamas headbands or strumming their guitars alongside Hezbollah flags. They've called for the death of fellow students. They've said during disciplinary hearings that Zionists don't deserve to live. There should not be Zionists anywhere. If there are people like that who exist, shouldn't they die? only to be allowed right back on campus. The protests have their fair share of critics, many of whom call them anti-Semitic. Some even claim they promote violence against Jews. Antifada revolution! Antifada revolution! But the protesters deny these charges, pointing to the Jewish students who have joined their cause. Some have taken the press on guided tours of their encampments to demonstrate their peaceful forms of solidarity, from interpretive dance to setting up a makeshift flea market. You can purchase clothing, jewelry, and food, and all the proceeds are going to Palestine. The vibes in here are amazing today. So, if it's all amazing vibes, why have college students found themselves facing off against hundreds of riot police? Anti-Israel demonstrations began raging across the world on October 8th, 2023, one day after Hamas attacked Israel, killing 1,200 people and kidnapping another 253. When Israel began a military campaign in response, the protests grew. From day one, college students organized pro-Palestinian demonstrations, folding anti-war protests into regularly scheduled programming like Israel Apartheid Week, which they extended for an entire month. While most of the protests have been peaceful, some have gotten ugly. At least one person has been killed. But at Columbia University, pro-Palestinian students kicked things up a notch on April 17th when they set up an illegal tent city on the university's main lawn. Their choice of date wasn't a coincidence. Columbia's president, like the presidents of other prestigious schools, had been summoned to testify before a congressional panel about anti-Semitism on campus. Her testimony was scheduled for April 17th. I wouldn't have wanted to be in President Shafiq's shoes. The panel grilled her hard, and she promised the panel that she would enforce consequences for anti-Semitism on campus. There will be consequences. So, maybe not a coincidence that the student who claimed that Zionists don't deserve to live was only suspended after President Shafiq testified, even though he made the comments back in January. And so Columbia's tent city was set up as bait with the protesters hoping to reel in not just the school's president, but also the police, and of course, the media. And reel them in they did. The next day, April 18th, Shafiq allowed the NYPD onto Columbia's campus to clear away the encampments. The NYPD arrested over a hundred protesters and dismantled part of the encampment. But the next day, protesters were out in the streets, clashing with counter-protesters and cops alike. The police arrested at least one high-profile student, the daughter of Congresswoman Ilan Omar, who later lamented that she was homeless and hungry after being barred from her dorm on her college where students pay upwards of $90,000 a year to attend. Seemingly overnight, the movement mushroomed. If it's on a college campus, is the correct term shroomed? Students at other colleges began erecting tent cities of their own, challenging their schools to stop them from breaking both school rules and the law. And yet, most of the protesters do seem to understand that their tent cities aren't going to stop the war in Gaza, no matter how stirring their interpretive dances are. Stirring 
indeed. So what do they want? What's so important that's worth getting arrested and expelled? The answer? Divestment. Say what? Okay, so universities are obviously super expensive to operate and maintain. Yes, some private schools like Columbia charge really, really ridiculous tuition, but that's just a drop in the bucket when you consider how many people your average university employs, not to mention keeping up the infrastructure, buildings, cool new tech for labs, and I'm sure I'm just scratching the surface here. So in addition to tuition money, both private and public universities get donations, which collectively make up endowments, huge sums of money that are invested in the market. And I just want to be clear about the scale here. Some schools, including Columbia, have endowments worth tens of billions of dollars. And when your investment portfolio is that massive, at least some of your investments are bound to tick people off. Universities insist that they invest responsibly, but at least some of their investments run counter to some of their students' values. College students have a long history of demanding that their schools dump certain investments or divest. In fact, Columbia University led the charge to divest from the arms industry during the Vietnam War, and to divest from South Africa at the height of their wildly racist apartheid regime. And even though Columbia, like most universities, doesn't disclose where it invests, Columbia students and faculty have put together a list of companies that they say Columbia has invested in that do business with the Israeli government, including Google and Amazon. And so the protesters insist that Columbia divest from these companies immediately. Now, that doesn't mean that students aren't Googling things or buying stuff on Amazon. That's because for many of the protesters, the divestment is symbolic. They don't expect that their university's action will make a huge financial difference. They're looking to make a cultural difference. It's a domino effect. The more powerful institutions divest from Israel, the more isolated Israel becomes. The goal of the divestment movement is to turn Israel into an economically vulnerable pariah state. But the student protest movement goes beyond targeting just the Israeli government. A number of American schools have campuses in Israel, and many, many more offer study abroad programs in the Jewish state. Protesters have also demanded that their schools cut ties with Israeli educational institutions, and even Israeli academics and artists. And divestment isn't their only demand. As the protests have swelled and more and more students have been arrested, suspended, or even expelled, a growing number of students and faculty have demanded amnesty. In other words, they've set up an illegal encampment, refused to leave when asked, in many cases harassed Jewish students, gotten arrested after multiple warnings, and are now asking the university not to enforce any kind of punishment. As the kids on the internet say, well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. Look, I get where a lot of these protesters are coming from. From their perspective, a huge injustice is taking place in front of their eyes, and they want to help. They think they're doing the right thing, but that sense of righteousness has emboldened them to break the law. And when everyone believes it's okay to break the law for a good cause, you don't end up with peace. You end up with this. And ironically, these protests have mostly only managed to distract the media from the actual war happening. The hostages, the aid convoys, the bombings, the rockets, the stalled negotiations, the calls for a jihad. And while the protesters want to raise questions about their university's connections with Israel, they've ended up raising an entirely different set of questions. Like, what is the point of college? Why are students paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a college education if they can't answer basic questions about the ideas they claim to support? And what would you say is the main goal with tonight's uh, protest? I think the goal is just showing our support for Palestine and demanding that NYU stops. I honestly don't know okay. all of what NYU is doing. Do you know what NYU is doing? About what? About Israel. Why what? are we protesting here? Uh, yeah. Palestine will be free! I wish I was more educated. And by the way, protest leaders are very aware of the problem. Most of the students can't do much more than parrot talking points that fall apart entirely when pressed. I think that's a really false narrative. I think that that's a really false narrative. I think that it's a really false narrative. I think that this is also a really false narrative. Do you think October 7th and the attack that happened is a false narrative? Get out of my face, please. So organizers have gotten around this by giving the press very limited access to the encampments and denying them the chance to speak to students freely. Why can we not go through here? Because we're not letting media in right now. I know, I know, but this is a public campus. Why are we not able to go through? Because we're not letting media in right now. There's I know, an but who, going who are you? Well, what are you afraid of? Why do you not want to have people talk to you and find out what your protest is all about? 
Their own encampment rules encourage asking questions, but when they themselves are asked questions, they refuse to engage meaningfully. And then there's the constitutional questions that are getting raised by all of this. Does the First Amendment apply on private campuses? And does the First Amendment extend to encampments that disturb the peace, that prevent fellow students from accessing campus? More importantly, who gets to say what constitutes anti-Semitism and what doesn't? And what's the difference between feeling unsafe and actually being unsafe?